because of John 3.16, Nicodemus visiting Jesus in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21, is one of the most famous events in the entire Bible. Jesus and the woman at the well in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42, is also quite well known. But by comparison, the passage in between John 3, 22 through 36 is often forgotten. Even as I started thinking about what I was preaching on next after Nicodemus visited Jesus, my mind went to Jesus and the Samaritan woman when I realized, wait a minute, something else comes first. That something else goes by many different names, but most title it as John the Baptist testifying to or exalting Jesus. Yet even though this passage often escapes our memory, there are some great truths worthy of your consideration here this morning. Please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 22 through 36 today. John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36. Please stand together as we read God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant or without error word. John chapter 3, verses 22 through 36 as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study here in the Gospel according to John. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now, John was also baptizing in Aon near Salim because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard and what he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. This is the word of our Lord. You may be seated. Well, John chapter 3, verse 22, starts off by telling us how Jesus and his disciples have now left Jerusalem after the Passover in 30 AD, and they are going to minister throughout the rest of the land of Judea. But where exactly is Judea? Well, if you look at Israel today, so you're looking at a map and you're looking at Israel today, and if you divided the nation of Israel as it is today into three parts with a northern region, a central region, and a southern region, Judea would be that southern region. Judea was home to cities like Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and Jericho. The central region was called Samaria, where 
Jesus will soon meet the woman at the well in John chapter 4. And meanwhile, the northern region was called Galilee, home to places like Nazareth and, of course, the Sea of Galilee. With that in mind, Jesus is going to Judea. Jesus is going to other parts of southern Israel besides Jerusalem. And while doing so, John chapter 3, verse 22 indicates that Jesus is spending a lot of time just with his disciples. He's building them up. He's helping them to grow in their faith. But he is also at the same time ministering to others and other people are getting baptized. Now this small detail is an important lesson all by itself. Discipleship, helping other people to grow in their faith in the Lord Jesus is very important, but it's also a balancing act. It's very much a balancing act. One that I know I haven't mastered by any means, but in your own ministry, because we all have ministries in the front of every bulletin that we get. It says that every member is a minister of Christ, Jackie Prince on there. It says that for a reason, because we all have gifts and talents. We, we all have our own ministries that we do with the spiritual gift that God has given you, because every Christian has at least one spiritual gift. And so in your own ministry, it is important to, draw, to try to do what Jesus does right here. Build depth with a few, but also be broad on the basics with as many as you possibly can, while at the same time realizing you can't do everything. You'd like to, I'd like to, but you can't do everything. Not even Jesus did, even though he's the only one who actually could have. John chapter 4 verse 2 will tell us later that Jesus actually isn't personally baptizing anyone himself, rather his disciples are. And, and the likely reason for this is not only to set an example for us, showing that, hey, I, Jesus like, I can do everything, but I'm not going to, to be an example for you, that you who can't do everything don't act like you can. But there's also probably another reason here too as well, Jesus probably realizes, in fact, he most certainly realizes that if he baptizes anyone, that later on that person's going to be like, ooh, I got baptized by, whoa, that moved. <laughs> I got baptized by Jesus himself. This is usually how he doesn't move. Uh, but uh, yeah, they would have thought themselves as super Christians because, oh man, I got baptized by Jesus. I got baptized by the Lord and Savior of all. And you can easily picture the bragging rights. Who'd you get baptized by? Oh, Peter. Oh, that's nice. He denied Christ three times. I got baptized by Jesus. He never sinned, you know. So you can just picture that, can't you? Yeah, I can. Humility, though, is important. We even talked about it in Sunday school because God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so Jesus just preaches, and his disciples are the ones who do the baptizing. The Apostle Paul, by the way, will follow this model as well, according to 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 17. But as people in Judea or southern Israel are getting baptized as a result of Christ's preaching ministry, Chapter 3, verse 23 says that John the Baptist is baptizing at Inon near Salim. And the most likely location for these twin cities is in the northeast corner of Samaria, that central region of Israel, uh, near uh, the Jordan River, uh, just north of Judea. And a big reason why John is in this area is because the text says that this place has much water. Now, I've already talked about this in a previous sermon on the Gospel of John, so let me just restate this very quickly. If the proper method of baptism is just sprinkling or pouring a tiny bit of water 
on the head, you wouldn't need a lot of water. You just wouldn't. But the fact that John needs much water to baptize is evidence that he is fully immersing people in water, just like the Greek word baptize indicates. To baptizo means immerse, uh, to dunk, if you will. John 3.24 is a quick explanatory note giving even more detail about the timing of when this passage took place. We already saw it's after the Passover in 30 AD, but now we are told that this is before John the Baptist is thrown in prison. Now, when does that happen? Well, uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, and Mark chapter 1, verse 14, both tell us that Jesus leaves for Galilee in the northern region of Israel after hearing about John being taken into custody. And this cross-references with John chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, where Jesus decides to leave Judea for Galilee by way of Samaria. And so in John 3, 24, we see that John the Baptist is going to get arrested in the time frame of John 4, 3 through 4. That's really quick. That's the next chapter quick. That's just a couple verses into the next chapter quick. John is very close to the time when he's going to get arrested. But why does John get in such trouble? Why does he get arrested? Good question. What's the answer? It's because he rightly criticized a marriage that should have never happened. He rightly criticized a marriage that should have never happened. You know, just last week, YouTube removed one of my sermons from four years ago uh, because I rightly criticized the Obergefell decision. In fact, when I looked at my, the YouTube channel, the church's YouTube channel, on Monday, this is when I noticed it, I was uploading another sermon. I was like, you violated community guidelines. And I'm like, what did I do? You know, you know, so, and I looked and they said, yeah, we removed your first sermon on Galatians. And I'm like, what? Why? And that was a long time ago. You know, <laughs> and yep, that's what it was. Uh, now, I just got a light slap on the wrist compared to John. I didn't even get a strike uh, on the channel. Uh, just a warning. But it does show what Ecclesiastes says is true. There's nothing new under the sun. Now, the wrongful marriage that John criticized in his case was between Herod Antipas and Herodias. Now, both were in another marriage when Herod Antipas and Herodias committed adultery with each other. And then they decided, after committing adultery, that they would divorce their current spouse so that they could get married. And if that wasn't bad enough, Herodias' first husband was the half-brother of Herod Antipas. So was John the Baptist being judgmental for calling that out? Google's making that claim against me, but what does the Bible say? When Jesus told us not to judge in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, we hear that all the time. Judge not lest you be judged. When Jesus told us not to judge in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, he makes it very clear in the following verses that he is specifically talking about hypocritical judgments. Specifically talking about hypocritical judgments and he uses this illustration to explain it. He talks about taking out a sliver in someone else's eye when you have a log stuck in your own eye. That's hypocritical. You shouldn't do that. And so hypocritical judgments, when Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged, hypocritical judgments is what Jesus is talking about. That's what Jesus doesn't like. But recognizing a pearl is a pearl, 
recognizing a pig is a pig and therefore not casting pearls before swine, which is what Jesus talks about right after the sliver and the log. Jesus says that's something everybody needs to do. You need to recognize a pearl is a pearl and a pig as a pig and don't cast your pearls before swine. God clearly says in his word what's right and what's wrong. And every society either stands on that or falls into ruin. And that's not surprising. Just look at the history of the world. Even if you don't like world history very much, if you just study it a little bit, just know a little bit about the history of the world, you will see there's only one kingdom that lasts forever. All the rest fall. Rome fell. The Greeks fell. The Egyptians fell. The, all, all kingdoms fall over time, except for one, the kingdom of God. That lasts forever. John the Baptist has both the right and the moral obligation to call what Herod and Herodias did a sin, not because it was his opinion, it was because God said that's a sin wasn't merely wrong in somebody's opinion. John the Baptist isn't being hypocritical. He doesn't have a sliver or a log in his own eye when he's taking the sliver out of Herod and Herodias' eye. He was just saying to Herod Antipas and Herodias, how could you take the beautiful pearl that is God's gift of marriage and throw it in the pigsty? How could you do that? That's all he's saying. That's all we as Christians are saying too, by the way, today. But when we point this out to those who love the pigsty, one of two things is going to happen. Some, by the grace of God, will either wake up, realize they're in the pigsty, <laughs> repent, and turn to the Lord. But others are just going to get mad. They're going to get mad. They're going to compound their sin like Herod and Herodias did in arresting and ultimately executing John the Baptist. Now, as Christians, let's be honest. We cannot control how people respond. But no matter what, we have an obligation out of love for the Lord and love for our neighbor to stand on his word. Because he, as the creator of the universe, knows what's good. He knows what's beautiful. He knows what's true. While the world, the flesh, and the devil seek to twist the good, the beautiful, and the true into something evil. As it is, John chapter 3, verses 25 through 36 represents John the Baptist's final public statements before the ones that get him wrongfully arrested and murdered. And if we read this passage with that in mind, his words here suddenly become a lot more powerful, don't they? Yes, they do. Now what John the Baptist has to say here is set up by a dispute. Most manuscripts, including the oldest ones, say verse 25 is a dispute between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew or one Jewish religious leader as opposed to many. And their dispute is said to be over purification. But we quickly find out in verse 26, it's specifically about baptism. Baptism arising out of the purification rituals in the Old Testament. Now, to break it down even further, the dispute seems to be over the fact that this lone Jewish religious leader has informed the disciples of John the Baptist that the disciples of Jesus are now baptizing even more people than they are. They were baptizing a lot, but this Jesus guy over here, man, there's a lot more people getting baptized by his disciples. And what happens? 
Well, this clearly creates jealousy because in verse 26, the disciples of John the Baptist take this information to their teacher and notice what they say. Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. You sense the jealousy? Oh yeah, it's thick. The disciples of John the Baptist notice they don't even call Jesus by name. Don't even say his name. Why is that? Well, it's the same reason why we sometimes choose not to say the name of somebody because if you say someone's name, that humanizes them. The thought is, well, if I don't use their name, then I can speak worse of them. It's almost like they're less than human. I'm doing that with Jesus. Oh my goodness. But that's not the only hint of jealousy we notice. The Baptist disciples are also exaggerating. They're saying, all are coming to him. All are coming to him. Did literally all people come to Jesus? We wish that were the case, but no. Uh, many didn't back then and many still don't today. John the Baptist's disciples are exaggerating because they are now feeling that their ministry is somehow threatened by Christ's ministry. And, and so they don't even use his name and, and they exaggerate his accomplishments. And I have to ask, how often does that happen today? It happens a lot. A new church moves into the community and it, it seems like they have a more dynamic preacher and, and better programs and, and they are attracting a lot more people. And what happens to the older, more established church? A lot of times they get jealous. Start complaining. In this case, the message is, hey, John the Baptist, Jesus is doing better than you are. So we need to do something. You need to do something, John the Baptist. How can you and I avoid falling into such a potentially toxic trap? The answer starts in John 3.27. John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Your ministry, my ministry, whatever it is, all of our ministries individually and collectively, where are they from? From God. God in heaven. They're a gift from him. And every single person who is a part of those ministries, guess what? Also a gift. Y'all are a gift to me. I hope y'all know that. You really are. I see you as a gift to me. Well, a gift I don't deserve. One I've been given from above. Every true ministry belongs to the Lord. Not to me. Not to you. And furthermore, the people who are a part of those ministries, they also belong to him. And, and last I checked, none of us are Jesus. I know I'm not. And in verse 28, Jesus reminds his disciples of what he said before. I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. And that's true also for us. None of us are Jesus, but all of us have been sent out on his behalf. This isn't the Keith Lowdy show. Uh, if it were, I would tell you right now, you, this is a colossal waste of your time. Uh, if it was just the Keith Lowdy show. Because the only reason why anything I say would matter is if it's biblical. If it matches what God's word says. A true ministry and a true ministry mindset 
is all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about us. It's about him. And John the Baptist captures this imagery perfectly in verse 29 by talking about a wedding. Love weddings. A lot of them this time of the year, and it's a great thing. When you go to a wedding, only the bridegroom gets the bride. The friend of the bridegroom, what we would call the best man, he doesn't get the bride. Uh, the same would go for the maid of honor. She doesn't get the groom. The best man and the maid of honor aren't the ones getting married. So why are they there? To support the bride, to support the groom. And a good best man, a good maid of honor rejoices in their friend's happiness. But let's take John's illustration to an even more spiritual level. The bride here in verse 29 is the people of God. It's Israel in the Old Testament according to passages like Jeremiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. And it's the church in the New Testament and beyond, according to Ephesians 5.25. The bride of the church then obviously belongs to the groom, Jesus Christ. And the best man and the maid of honor shouldn't be jealous about that. They should rejoice in that. Ministry isn't about you. It isn't about me. It's about bringing as many people as possible closer to Jesus. This is why John the Baptist says in John 3.30, He must increase, but I must decrease. Real ministry requires real humility. Because let's be honest, if anyone, if any human being, strictly human being, could take pride in what they accomplished, it would be John the Baptist. It would definitely be John the Baptist. He prepared the way for Christ's ministry. He baptized Jesus himself. He gave up two of his own disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and John, the son of Zebedee, to follow Jesus. And in doing so, all who will ever believe in Jesus do so because of John the Baptist's initial testimony. These are hefty accomplishments, greater than the accomplishments of any other minister throughout history in the 2,000 years since John the Baptist. So much so that Jesus will say later in Matthew 11, 11, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. And yet John says in chapter 3, verses 30 through 31, talking about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. And he who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. John the Baptist says he's just a man. For all of his accomplishments, he's just a man. Earthly. Sinful. We are too. I am. We don't know everything. We make mistakes. We don't always say what we should, and sometimes what we should say, we don't. And that's true for me. But as God, it's not true for Jesus. Jesus is above all. John 3.32 talks about how Jesus has seen it all, how he's heard it all, and so he testifies of the truth. But sometimes it seems like no one receives his testimony. So many people reject Jesus because they love their sin more than they love the truth. But whoever receives Christ's testimony in John 3.33 certifies that God is true. And if God is true, everything he says is 
truth. Therefore, the Bible, as God's word, is of the utmost value because it is God's truth. This book is God's truth for us. Your ministry, my ministry, all of our ministries, they're only as good as they are biblical. All those who take the Great Commission seriously are sent. But when God the Father sent his one-of-a-kind son, that was an even bigger deal. And that's what John 3.34 gets into. Literally everything Jesus spoke, everything he spoke, was the word of God. None of us can claim that. I can't claim that. And as Christians, again, if you are a follower of Jesus who has turned from their sins and trusted in him, all of us are blessed with at least one spiritual gift. If you don't know what that is, I'd be happy to give you a spiritual gift survey later to kind of help you figure that out. All of us are blessed with at least one spiritual gift, but unlike us, Jesus used the power of the Holy Spirit without measure or without limit. Now, we pray that God would heal people, and sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't, but Jesus never ever came into contact with anybody that he couldn't heal immediately. He fixed it just like that. Every time. In fact, when Jesus comes back, everything that's broken now, he will fix. Just like that. He's that powerful. He has the Holy Spirit without measure, without limit. You and I don't have power like that. Jesus does. John 3.16 tells us how much and in what way God the Father loves us. And God really does love you so very much. But John 3.35 tells us that God the Father loves God the Son even more. So much more that the Father has given all things into his hand. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18, that all authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. I just mentioned John 3, 16. As it turns out, John 3, 36 is John the Baptist's version of John 3, 16 through 18. Uh, in fact, it's, it's interesting. John 3.16 is, is such a beloved verse. It's the most beloved verse in the whole Bible. Have you realized, though, that it's restated several different times throughout Scripture? It's such an important verse. It's not said word for word elsewhere, but different people have their own version of it. It sounds very similar in other places. John 3.36 is John the Baptist's version of John 3.16. Uh, you could say that Romans 5, 8 through 10 is Paul's version of John 3, 16. Uh, John, the son of Zebedee, also has a couple different versions of John 3, 16 in 1 John 4, 9 through 10 and 1 John 5, 11 through 12. It's not surprising that the Holy Spirit would repeat the core principles of John 3, 16 many times elsewhere. But in John the Baptist's version of John 3, 16 through 18, he says in John 3, 36, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides or remains on him. Now I've already spent some time talking about the wrath of God in previous sermons, but I'd like to close this one by saying what God has to say about everlasting life. Because that's important too. And I just want to read some passages uh, out of the book of Revelation that speak about this. Because they're so hopeful. They're so great. And I just want to read what they say. Uh, Revelation 21, 1 through 7 is the first one I'll read. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God, 
like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for all of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all of these blessings, and I will be their God and they will be my children. Revelation 22, 1 through 5 then adds, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. You read that, and you're like, oh, I thought heaven was just sitting on a cloud, playing a harp. Nope, not that at all. Uh, so much more to the new heaven and the new earth. These are truly glorious places with a city, if you like the city, or if you're like me, you like nature, and you like to be in nature. doesn't matter if you like the city or you like nature. New heaven and new earth is going to have both. And you're going to get to enjoy both. You will never cease to enjoy both while also enjoying the creator and savior of it all. And with that in mind, I leave you with these words from Revelation 22, 16 through 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you of these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life.